that would be wonderful. And uh, this morning we are going to be in Micah chapter 3. This morning we're going to be in Micah chapter 3 in the Old Testament. And the last time the message was titled Full Circle. Full Circle. So, you know, it, it's an interesting thing. And, you know, we can look at things on a micro level, which really are great applications. What's my walk with the Lord, right? This micro level, um, fine details of personal relationship. It's something that God desires. But then we also look at things on a macro level. So, uh, we looked at the macro level as far as the Israelites, the ancient Israelites pre-Christ, and we looked at the stages that they had gone through, right? God blessed them, uh, and, but, and then they would prosper. And sometimes the prosperity was so abundant that it caused some of the Israelites to move away from God. And when it happened in leadership, and certainly the spiritual system, that was very dangerous because they became estranged from God. Uh, so that sometimes led to spiritual debauchery, which led to declension, which led to, unfortunately, God having to discipline his people. Um, hopefully, many times it would lead to repentance, restoration, and then the blessings would start again. So you'd see these kind of highs and lows in the macro level of the life of the ancient Israelites. So here we're in the 8th century BC. It's a long time ago in a land far, far away, pretty much. Um, so I'm here to kind of get you up to speed based on what we're reading. Uh, today the message is titled, It Takes Two. Now, It Takes Two. We're talking about personal relationship. We're talking about the Israelites and their relationship with the Lord. But very importantly, instead of looking at a Sunday sermon as, as some abstract concept and to go home and say, well, that was interesting. I like the history. Um, we really need to look at this in a personal level. You know, I do this. Where, I'm, where, am I, where am I with the Lord, right? How close am I to the Lord? You know, you, you look at some of the indicators in your own life. And this is a blessing because if you're here this morning or you're watching on the live stream and you're at a place where you feel you're just a little distant from God, remember, he never moves. He's a constant. He always wants to be close to us. This is a great, uh, no shame way of saying, you know what, Lord, I, I just want to come back, right? He's always got that door open for us. So, we're going to look at it at a macro level, but we're also going to look at it in a micro level as well. And we're going to look at this in four parts. Starting with verse one. This is heavy. <laughs> as soon as right out of the gate, it's, it's heavy, and I'm going to have to do a lot of explaining here. So uh, chapter three, verse one. And I, Micah, the prophet, I said, hear now heads of Jacob and you rulers of the house of Israel. Is it not for you to know justice, you who hate good? and love evil, shouldn't it be the other way around, who stripped the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people, flay their skin from them, break their bones, and chop them in pieces like meat for the pot, like flesh in the cauldron. If you just had breakfast this morning, I apologize. I should have warned you, but what are we talking about here? One out of four is the allegory. It's an allegory of civil authority. We're not talking about cannibalism here. Um, so when we look at this, you see how God is saying through Micah the prophet, how symbolically the civil authorities, the, the leaders of the people are destroying their own people and really they're God's people. He's entrusted them to care for his own people. And, you know, the prophets had to be very brave uh, think about this. I wonder, there's an expression that we have in our culture, in our vernacular, is don't kill the messenger. I don't know if that originated from the prophets, but sometimes the leaders would kill the messengers. They would kill the prophets. We know this from history because they didn't like what they were hearing. But again, it was God's message through the prophets. They had to be brave. I want to read to you Warren Wearsby in his book, Be Concerned. And he says something very interesting on page 119, and he says, few men are as pitiable, this isn't a good thing, are as pitiable as those who claim to have a call from God, yet tailor their sermons to please others. Their first rule is don't rock the boat. Their second is give the people what they want. But a true servant of God declares God's message regardless of whether the people like it or not. He'd like to be a peacemaker, but sometimes he has to be a troublemaker. 
No wonder Jeremiah cried out, Alas, my mother, that you gave me birth, a man with whom the whole land strives and contends. So think about that when your friends tempt you to watch these feel-good preachers on the Internet, right? Because they're not given the whole story. They're only giving a part of it. So what were the details of the complaint? Number one, you're supposed... So let's go back to the civil authorities in Israel. You're supposed to know justice in your positions, but you don't practice it. And in verse 2, he says you hate good and love evil. Wow, I mean... Has anything changed in 3,000 years? Don't we see this in, in our culture, in our country? Everything is done by polls, my goodness. Politicians can't get up in the morning and start their day without looking at polls, internal polls, national polls. They live their lives by this. So the more decadent the culture becomes, the more decadent the politicians become. We see that in America. Just do what's right. I mean, in my conscience, if I was a politician, I would... If I got voted and I just want to do what's right, and if I only get one term, I get one term. So verses 2 through 3, there's this allegory of butchering the people to make a meal out of them by their leaders. And again, this is uh, an understatement that God is displeased with the corruption that he's seeing in society. It's an understatement, his displeasure. But we even know today that spiritual corruption is the foundation for all other sins. You know, and I don't, I don't, you know, I criticize more my generation than Gen Zers, but I meet a lot of, I always talk to people, strangers, you know, um, usually it goes well. Sometimes people think I'm weird and I'm in their comfort zone, but, you know, I don't push the issue, right? But I like building bridges and just a lot of Gen Zers are not familiar with the concepts in the Bible. And again, that's a problem with my generation, how we fail to teach them. Um, and you, you kind of got to get them up to speed. And they look at the world, they look at the country, and they know intuitively something is very wrong, very wrong, but they don't know why. So the truth is, whenever there are problems in civil leadership, in, in government, in culture, it starts with a spiritual vacuum. It's, it starts with a spiritual foundation. You remove the things of God, the precepts, from the culture and there's a vacuum that ensues and all kinds of things find their way into the culture. So um, I, just, I just find it very enjoyable to get people up to speed on why we're seeing the things that we're seeing, right? Uh, verse four, continuing on, he says, then they will cry to the Lord. So this would be the civil leaders, politicians, king's courts. They'll cry to the Lord, right? Because uh, nations now, the Assyrians, the Babylonians are starting to invade and take over cities. Uh-oh, we're in trouble. But he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time because they have been evil in their deeds. So two out of four is deaf ears both sides. And I look at this where, again, who moves first? It wasn't God. God is a constant. He's our father. He's the creator. He's always there. Adam, where are you? You know, I'm, I'm here, Adam. What happened? You, a, I can sense a distance. Of course, God knows what happened. He's trying to get Adam to think for himself. But it's the same thing with human nature. So deaf ears, the people moved away from God, right? The, the people, the poor and middle class, uh, the, the government, the spiritual leaders, we're going to get to them. So God, there's an estrangement, there's a distance between the people and God. And sometimes, you know, I find myself sometimes acting as if I'm God's attorney or his PR person. He doesn't need me. But just to explain, because people say, well, what is God? He's being vindictive. He's trying to show them something. No, that's not the truth. The truth is there's consequences of an estranged relationship, especially when they're doing things that are so vile to the vulnerable so God's going to help out the leaders so they can continue to prey upon the vulnerable? Of course not. Try that with a person just that you know. Uh, I mean, don't try it, but let's just give an example of a friend, a best friend, a sibling, somebody close to you where you just ghost them for five years, ten years. You just, you just ignore them. You don't take their calls. You don't, you're not concerned about their well-being. And then after ten years, call them up and say, hey, um, I'm in a pinch for money. Can you lend me $20,000? Click boo, you know, uh, so you wouldn't do that, or you, hopefully you wouldn't do that here, 
And they were trying to do that with God. They were not repentant. They just were in trouble. Let's go to, if we could, Jeremiah 7. I'm going to teach that one day. I love Jeremiah. I've never gotten around to teaching it. But Jeremiah 7, 16, I just love his heart. Um, it says, therefore do not pray. So this is God speaking to Jeremiah. This is a personal thing. He says, therefore do not pray for this people, nor lift up a cry or a prayer for them, nor make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. Wow. When God is silent. And God is saying to the prophet, hey, you know, Jeremiah, I love you, and I know you're trying to do my will, but don't waste your breath because this has to play out. These consequences, these ramifications have to play out. Now, don't get me wrong. What did I say in the opening? When there's repentance, I explained this concept to my son. Repentance, it isn't, okay, some time has passed. Let's just move on and go back to the way things were. That's not how it works. Repentance is a change of heart. It's a change of heart. I don't want to do these behaviors anymore. I don't want to go in this direction. I don't want to wound you. I don't want to hurt you anymore. So the thing is, the leaders were just, let's move on. We don't want the Assyrians to get or the Babylonians later. But God was basically saying to them, you're just going to have to reap what you sow uh, right now. But again, it's tragic when God is silent. I know that when I became a Christian, I was a few years into being a police officer, uh, maybe five, six years-ish. I started, somebody kind of taught me about the Lord, and I started going to a church, and, you know, my life changed. And then from that point on, even in my profession, right, I'm thinking, oh, Joe, I can handle anything, you know? It was all about how I could get, you know, this, this way and smarter and, and more clever and stronger. But then I became a Christian. I'm like, you know what? I want God in my life. I want God in my career. So every day I would suit up, put on my uniform, my equipment, and I'd drive to work. And in the drive to work, I would just pray to the Lord. Lord, help to keep me safe. Give me wisdom. Give me compassion. I would go through this whole prayer with the Lord every time I went into work. And you know what? From that point to my retirement, I don't think I regretted any of my decisions because he was there. Let me tell you something. I had some close calls, and the Lord was there. That's a profession where you need the Lord. Just to, to the guy out in the lobby, I hope you're, you're listening, because, you know, this is important, right? It'll save your life. But it, again, God doesn't just want some lip service. He wants a relationship. Amen? Then I think about being a pastor, which is we're going on 22 years at this point. Same thing. There's been things that have happened, people who have come into the church and caused problems, and, you know, the, just, I pray the Lord, I just need the wisdom to make sure, you know, <laughs> to, to do what I'm supposed to do. Uh, Pastor Vinny told me, and this, I take this very seriously, I was talking about kids in the opening, and the children's ministry, and VBS, but Pastor Vinny told me a few Sundays ago that we had 41 kids downstairs in the classroom. That's a lot of kids, 41 kids. You know, and I feel a, a spiritual responsibility to those kids who look up to me. And maybe if I'm tempted to lose my cool or, or, or the old Joe to, to come out in the flesh, I think about those little kids. And if I ever was removed from this position because of something stupid that I did, how would those kids look at, at me? You know, it would break my heart. So that is a big, it's a big part of just saying to the Lord, just keep me grounded, keep me close, right? <laughs> Shaking your heads. <laughs> you, you all have professions and family and things where you need the same thing. You just want to be close to the Lord. Amen? So this is, this is serious business. Now, let me just put a caveat. I got two, two very large caveats in here. Is that God... If the leaders truly repented and had a heart change and in unison, you know, a great revival. This has happened in Israel. This has happened in sections of the United States. It's happened in other countries. And God responds to that revival, a, a mass turn, not in every single person, but a, a turning back to the things of God, turning back to the Lord. Lord, we want to change. You know what? God always opens the doors. He doesn't hold grudges. He's not a mean-spirited God, but there's got to be repentance. So I, I'm, I'm making this crystal clear. They weren't repenting. They were just saying, we're in trouble, and hey, we're Israelites, and Lord, you owe me. And I'm, that's my paraphrase. And you know what? Sometimes Christians can do that too. 
right? We see some dark portions of history and, and some, you know, time periods where, where there were Christians and things that had happened, and it's not pretty, right? I mean, do, do, do they, did they have a personal relationship with Jesus, or was it just a moniker? Was it just something, oh, I'm a Christian. Okay, well, is it just in word, or is it in deed as well? So these are important things. Verse 5, continuing on. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets. So he's very clear to make the differentiation between the different groups of people and what their issues were. So he says, who make my people stray. This is God speaking through Micah. Who chant peace while they chew with their teeth, but who prepare war against him, who puts nothing into their mouths. Therefore, you shall have night without vision. You shall have darkness without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets, and the day shall be dark for them. So the seers shall be ashamed, and the diviners abashed. Indeed, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. Three out of four is, now it's the prophet's turn. So yes, civil authorities, kings, courts, governors, etc. Now he's saying, he's actually addressing the religious people, the echelon, with a scathing rebuke because they were not men of God anymore. They had sold themselves for money or for pleasure or, listen, there's a lot of um, false teachers even today that will warm up to politicians and powerful people. And you see these videos just so that they can be welcomed in to that echelon. They live very well. Um, and listen, nothing wrong with having money, but, but how do you get that money is the question, right? So we see it today. They're not sheep. They're not shepherds. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. So what happened was they, they actually relied on their dead religion going along with the culture. And we have to wonder today, what do religious leaders say today? And it's not just in one denomination. What is the Pope saying? What is the leader or the president of the Baptist Convention? What is the, some of these, I've listened, listen, I listen to a lot of people, some of these Calvary Chapel guys who have gone sort of global. What are they saying it's not a one-for-one, one, but I find that the more powerful people get, the less they preach the gospel. Do, do a little study on that. So-called religious leaders, right? Jesus said, go out into the world and preach the message of the good news of salvation. Why wouldn't you want to tell the world the good news? Why wouldn't you want to tell the leaders of Germany and France and Nigeria and Chad and, you know, the Philippines... If you are a religious leader and you're going to the G7 and you're going to some of these summits, are you preaching the gospel? And some of these religious leaders never preach the gospel. They talk about a lot of things, talk about climate change and uh, world events and social events, which is fine. But the primary thing, this is why people are so deceived in the world, because they follow these religious leaders who aren't feeding them. So close to 3,000 years later, it's the same thing. They're putting nothing in their mouths. The religious leaders are only putting stuff in their mouths. They live very well off the people's money. So nothing changes. Let's look at the Lord's complaint against them. So this is an interesting sort of interspersed pejoratives. In other words, he says they do A, and then they do B, and then they go back to A, and then they go back to B, as in subjects. So let me explain. It's a little hard to follow. He says, they lead the people astray, but they chant peace, but they prepare war against the people. The, so in other words, you know, and, and stuff is being put in their mouths. They're living good. They're in king's courts. Um, people love them. They're celebrities. See a lot of celebrities today. So they're going to tell the people what they want to hear. We just, I just read it from Warren Wiersbe. Guy's an incredible sage soul. Um, and his ministry, and he's done a lot of really great work. A lot of wisdom there. But they, what the religious leaders do is they'll, they'll do, remember the, what we read the last time about, you know, uh, prophesying of wine and drink, basically, you do what I want, and as a religious leader, I'm going to tell you you're fine with God. How does someone have the conscience to do that when they know they're lying? <laughs> so 
but they prepare war. How? In two ways. Number one, they, they get the people to be so far removed from God. Oh, that's archaic. We hear that today. Well, the Bible's archaic. Okay, well, I just went on the History Channel, and there's old people with PhDs and degrees, and they're saying, well, the Bible was right. So who, who do you want to listen to? The more we get into archaeology and science, the more we prove the Bible is real. So the, the religious leaders get the people estranged from God, and they, they get them unprepared for war, for the Assyrians to come in from town to town. Uh, they get them unprepared spiritually. They get them estranged from God. That's not good either. They also, they chew with their teeth, right? They're living well. They're, they're eating whatever they need to eat while putting nothing in the mouths of their followers. Be careful who you're following. Some, every once in a while, somebody comes up to me and says, oh, you got to listen to this preacher. I, I know a lot of really good ones. I just was listening to a segment of yesterday, just flipping through the channel, saw Jack Hibbs. I think he's a pretty solid guy. But sometimes people will send me stuff, and I always say, you know what, just do me a favor before you make me vet the person. Just you do your own vetting because I can't listen to someone who I consider ivory tower clergy. They refuse to get their hands dirty. They refuse to be among the people, right? They've got their own entourage and they're separated. There's a class system or a caste system in religion. I can't listen to a person like that. And if I do, it's only because I'm investigating and doing my homework because I'm going to say something on Sunday. But I can't deal with, and I can't respect ivory tower clergy. I just can't. And that's what we see here. So that's sort of something that I coined. Um, you know, this is, it, I think it's, it's pretty much self-explanatory. Verses 6 through 7. There's a total spiritual blackout. We look at the symbols. He speaks about, like, let's look at the common denominator. He speaks about night, no vision, darkness, the sun going down, dark days. Okay. I was asking my wife, you know, sometimes I have these memories of places I've been and I'm like, where was I? What state was it? And it's happening, you know, as you get older. I remember being there. I just, I think it was Pennsylvania. So she confirmed what I thought. Years ago, we went to a tour and it was Pennsylvania and it was a cave, right? This, this tour guide was a little, a little on the edge um, with some of the stuff he did. But so we all, a bunch of, bunch of people, we go down. You know, we're at his mercy. We're going down. He's showing us the formations, and we're going further down. For, you know you're descending. And there's all these lights that are strung up, right? So you can see where you're going. And then he says, okay, everyone, um, I'm going to shut the lights off. He didn't take a vote. He just did it. <laughs> And let me tell you something, you know, when you're laying in your bed and there's the moonlight and something coming through your blinds, ambient light, you know, stuff from your, your alarm clock, there's always light. We went down pretty far and he just shut the lights out. Some people screamed. And in my mind, my mind I thought, oh, this could be the end. Um, or he could turn the lights back on. Hopefully he's not a weirdo, right? So, but the first thing I did when the lights went off was, first thing I did is I did this. I went, I can't see my hand. <laughs> You know, if I do this now, my eyes cross a little bit when it gets closer because the focus, you know, because you're, you're, you're both eyes and they cross. When I did this down at the cave, I touched my nose. My eyes didn't do anything. They couldn't see anything. Okay, Pastor Joe, why do we have to hear about this? <laughs> because I'm making an analogy. That's the answer. I anticipate questions. So basically, this was, for me was a total light blackout. But for the spiritual leaders, it was a total spiritual blackout. So now when somebody asked them, hey, what's God saying? Hey, what's going to happen? They either had a lie or they had no answer. And they were ashamed. They were embarrassed because God cut off that line to them, right? Um, and I think about, too, what, what, what are things going to be like? A spiritual Darth in the seven-year tribulation. Now, people will still get saved, but the culture and the, and the world is going to be so bad. Nobody has to go through that. They can just you know, receive Christ today, and when the Lord comes back, He never uh, judges the righteous with the wicked. You don't have to deal with that seven-year period. So, a little encouragement there. Take the first flight out of here. Don't take the second one. It's pretty, a lot of turbulence on that one. So, you know, so we look at this, right? Uh, verse 7. You know, again, his, his silence would cause the spiritual leaders to be ashamed. Okay, I want to give you another analogy, and then I want to I'll bring my second caveat into this. Sometimes I wonder, like I don't want to experience it, but I wonder, like, I, like if I could interview somebody, 
What was it like? So you think about Saul. Remember King Saul, the, the first, arguably the first king of Israel? And, you know, it seemed like he was doing good for a while. He was in an office of the king, and that was a spiritual office. But he slowly, right, the Bible says that the, that the Lord had left him. Uh, he started doing his own thing. He started not regarding the Lord. And, you know, he was so used to the accoutrements of being spiritually protected that his last battle, he goes out into war. And it was a horrible, horrible loss for the Israelites. Also think about Samson. Samson had an office too not with air conditioning and stuff, but in office as far as like he was a judge. He was one of the judges of Israel. And he was the same way. He, I, I don't know, he was throwing the Philistines around like rag dolls. Maybe it went to his head. I'm Samson. Nobody can touch me. And he started to pull away from God and do evil things and uh, go back on the vow and the covenant he made uh, with the Lord. And when it was Delilah and she had cut his hair and she woke him up and said, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He probably got up, he thumped his chest, he flexed, he put his hands up, and the Philistines came in and the blows started landing like they never did before. Probably got hit in the head, face a few times, kicked to the ground, kicked in the ribs, kicked, pummeled, and then they pulled his eyes out. And I wonder at one point in his mind did he say, wow, I am so far from God. I, I didn't think that this was going to happen, but it says in the scripture that the Spirit of God left him. That's scary. You know, in my almost 22 years of being a pastor, like I've always wanted to stay close to the Lord. And, you know, my personal life has had ups and downs. My wife and I haven't had a charmed life. We've had our trials and tribulations. We've had it in the church. We've had trials and tribulations in the church. But I've always sensed that the Lord was with me. I never want to lose that. I never want to lose that. And we see some of these situations, and I believe they're in the Scripture to warn us not to get to that point, not to get to that point. Um, we see there's, a, there's another pastor, well-known, wrote many books. I'm not going to say the name first because not all the information is in, but he, he has removed himself from ministry. Probably 75, 80% of you will know who I'm saying if I said the name, and again, the facts are coming in, but he's removed himself, and he said, for a, I guess, some major sin, which usually when they say that, it's been going on for a while, it's usually not, oh, I made a mistake, it's like, yeah, you can be forgiven, but we, we don't know all the facts yet, but I wonder at what point a person thinks, I really think you know, I think the point where you're just starting to pull away from God, and you're, you're distant, I think you, I think every person knows, and listen, we have ups and downs, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, I am so tight with the Lord all the time. I mess up too. I have to repent like you do, right? But um, here's, here's another caveat as we get closer to the end. The caveat here is that let's say somebody is removed from ministry. Let's say they're in some grievous sin. Let's say, you know, Samson. It doesn't mean that they're not saved. If the criteria was when you die, you have to be in a perfect spiritual um, place, um, I don't, probably a lot of people aren't getting to heaven, you know? Let's see, I'm bleeding, I should really repent right now in case I lose all my hypovolemia. That's not how it works. So if we're saved, if we know the Lord, these prophets, did some of them repent? I'm sure they did. Did some of them not repent and stay estranged from God? and not, not go to heaven, I'm sure that happened as well. See, God is going to honor our free will. Do we want to be with the Lord in the end for all eternity, or do we not? Some people don't want to be with the Lord. They don't want to be with God for all eternity. God will honor that request, right? However, you can be saved. Let's just look at this 2024 post-Christ. You can be saved. Know the Lord, have trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and something happens, and you perish. doesn't mean... You know, if you're in a downslope or a, a, you know, a, a, a backsliding, it doesn't mean you're not going to heaven. So I just want to make that really, really clear. God is a merciful God. However, if you're in a ministry, he may remove you from office and put you on the spiritual shelf till you repent. But it doesn't mean that you're not saved. So that is something I want to make perfectly clear. As a matter of fact, Samson 
you know, he, they blinded him, they made him a slave, they made him, they made him like their little court jester. They were making fun of him because he, he really caused the Philistines a lot of problems. Then they, they have their big ceremony in their pagan temple and they, they chain him to the, the columns and what does Samson do? He cries out to the Lord. And he asks one more time for the strength to be able to do what he does. And he, you know, imagine the, the surprise, the chagrin of the Philistines when the whole thing started coming down. But um, heroes of faith, Samson's in there, right? So there had to be something in his heart that either repented or he never was so far away from God that he wasn't saved, but he was removed from office because God is so holy and pure that he will allow things to a point where he says he can't allow his character to be besmirched. He's a holy God. So some people will be put on the shelf. Amen? So we go from that and we move to the last few verses. This, these could be some questions for the Q&A. <laughs> Verse 8, it says, But truly, now this is Micah speaking, really on his own, right? He says, But truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Now hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob. I get the impression they weren't listening. <laughs> and rulers of the house of Israel who abhor justice, pervert all equity. Now think about even some religious leaders today who build up Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with iniquity. So continuing verse 11, her heads judge for a bribe. So now instead of doing their job, well, money's attached to it. Money's attached to everything. Her priests teach for pay. They weren't supposed to do that. And her prophets divine for money. They weren't supposed to do that. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, is not the Lord among us? No harm can come upon us. So there's an arrogance and the attitude is, we're fine. We're from the tribe of, you know, Benjamin or Judah. We're, we're, we're good. That wasn't the case. Verse 12, therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed like a field. Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins and the mountains of the temple like the bare hills of the forest. So four out of four is always be the remnant. So it begs the question, what's the remnant? I think sometimes even in the church and in different small groups, uh, maybe, you know, maybe a, a breakout after a home group, uh, people get together, Christians get together, and they, they talk about theoreticals. Well, what if this happens? Well, what if that happens? Well, you know, and all of these different theoreticals, but, and that's fine, but are we living the life, right? <laughs> it's very clear. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll follow my word. You'll do what I say. Now, to hear that from a person kind of is a little cringy, but this is the Lord, this is the one who wants the best for us. So we should do what he says, right? James, you don't just be hearers, but be doers also. Doing has to go with hearing, not just hearing. Um, so always be the remnant is in any culture, whether it was the Israelites pre-Christ, whether it's the United States 2024, whether it's Iran, whether it's China, whether it's Nigeria, whether it's Philippines, whatever, any today, there's the, there is a remnant in every single nation on the face of God's green earth. Amen. So the question to us is, instead of living in the hypotheticals, are we the remnant? doesn't mean we're perfect. doesn't mean we don't mess up. But it means that while the culture is becoming more decadent, we say, you know, I, I don't think I want to go in that direction. You're the remnant. You are the minority when it comes to the culture. You are the few. Do I want to follow all these churches that teach me that I can be filthy rich and just always ask God for stuff and be totally decadent um, and just think about myself? No, I don't want to do that because that's all over the internet. You see that stuff. You know, Micah was the remnant. Now, when you start reading what he says, you can get the wrong impression. He says, but truly I am full of the power, full of power by the spirit of the Lord. He wasn't being arrogant. He was trying to make a, a differentiation between what he was trying to do and the good prophets were trying to do and the false prophets. You know, look at the difference between the two. Who's filled with the Spirit? You know, if you've been a, a believer for a while, you know you can sense a person who's filled with the Spirit. 
He, he wasn't bragging, but drawing a contrast between the corruption and in the spiritual realm, which sometimes is hard to differentiate for some, and the remnant which Micah was a part of. And let me tell you something. That is God's preferential position for us. Whether it was the Israelite remnant, whether it was the Judean remnant, whether it was the New Jersey remnant. Amen? And that's available to us today with no exception. So if you felt yourself before you walked in here or watching on the live stream, if you felt yourself drifting, don't be ashamed. Just say to yourself, wow, this was the sermon I needed to hear. It takes two. God wants me close to him. Amen? You know, verse 8, he says to declare to Jacob his transgression. Again, there's always a, a time in ministry where we have to call things out. I've done it from this pulpit. Right? I've actually done it sometimes where people have given me a hard time and then time showed that it was, it was right. I was right. Oh, you know, you're, you're getting into... You know, I get sometimes into geopolitics. I get into cultural issues. It's part of what I do. It's my job. Sometimes we have to call these things out. But this could have been written in 2024. Again, looking at what the religious leaders were doing, everything was attached to money. My goodness, there's $10 books out there from Warren Wiersbe. If you said, I don't have $10, not only will we give you the book, but we'll send you home with groceries. You know what I'm saying? The things of spirituality should never be attached to money. We even talk about the men's retreat. I always say this. If you're struggling financially, don't not go. Let us know discreetly and we'll help you. Amen? Not give me money for a baptism, give me money for this, give me money for that. That's what they were doing. And it, boy, it's, that, that is still happening today. So um, again, going back to God allowing sort of this, this situation with Assyria and later Babylon to happen because he couldn't let his name be corrupted. You know what's fascinating? I believe it was Numbers 22. Remember King Balak and the prophet Balaam, remember? Okay, I don't know those names. Okay, do you remember in the Bible when the donkey was talking? Everybody remembers that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember that. that was pretty cool. So um, whether we're in Numbers or any part of the Scripture, this is the neat thing about the Gentiles. That's why so many Gentiles became believers in Yahweh. Because they said, they had conversations among themselves and said, you know, those Israelites are being naughty. At some point, God's not going to put up with it anymore because he's a holy God. This is amazing when your enemies know more about the theology that you're following than you do. Because uh, Balak and Balaam were having this discussion and said, you know, we can't get God to abandon his people. But what we can do, and, and you, once God is on your side, you can't do anything to these people, right? They knew that, the onlookers. But they, what they knew, they had devised a plan to tempt the children of Israel so much that they pulled away from God. Now we got them. <laughs> because God is so holy and perfect that he's not going to keep enabling them spiritually in that position that they're in. So it's, it's an amazing thing. So much good stuff in here. Um, and again, you know, we hear a lot of things today. We see justice, equity. You hear that on the, in the media. You hear that in, if you go to college, you hear it in academia. Unfortunately, the justice and equity that are trying to be pushed into our culture come from ungodly sources. And that's the problem. So to me, I want to know what does the Bible say? If I'm not practicing, even if I don't have to be a pastor, just a Christian, if I'm not treating people equally without prejudice, if I'm not practicing justice and I'm not pra practicing equity the way the Bible says, well, no worldly philosophy is going to convince me. If the Spirit of God isn't moving my cold heart to do these things for other people, right, then there's something wrong with, A, the teachings I'm following. And if you go to a Bible teaching church, that's not the problem. Or B, the way I am receiving the information and taking it home and living my life with it. Amen? Okay? So when I see a portion or I see people that call themselves Christian and practice prejudice or injustice or something, I say something is wrong. Number one, I want to know what type of church are they going to, and if the church is solid, why aren't they practicing it? So if we truly are believers of, of Yeshua, of Christ, we will treat everybody equally. My heart, even generosity, has changed. 
I was so stingy. Ask my wife. She's, she's, she, goes, yeah, she goes like this. Before I was a Christian, just with everybody, <laughs> except for me, of course. You know, the Lord has totally softened my heart when I became a Christian. A lot of really neat things happen. I mean, I'm not perfect, obviously. But, you know, it, these are great concepts in here. Oh, yeah, that's, that stuff is in the Bible. And with man, it's very difficult. But with God, all things are possible. Amen? So going back to uh, verse 11, he says, so this is at the end. The, the prophets are saying, I, you hear what Micah is saying? It's almost like they had like an open-air debate at some point. We, you hear what Micah is saying about us, but pff, it's not the Lord among us. No harm can come to us. The Assyrians aren't going to get through. The Babylonians aren't going to get through. And history showed that they were wrong because they relied on their religious system and rituals and heritage, right? And today, people rely on their denominations, seminary. How many pastors have fallen and they went to seminary? It doesn't, there's no insulation there. The only insulation against our own foolishness is a close relationship with the living God, right? So this is what they would do, and they re, were lying, relying on every other thing but a close relationship with their God. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. You realize that in John chapter 3, Jesus is talking to a religious, high echelon religious Pharisee. Pharisees. He comes to Jesus at night. Nobody's going to see me, my peers. And he starts asking Jesus questions about God, about coming to God. And like a little child, this man was so revered in the community. He went to Jesus. And Jesus didn't say, oh, you went to seminary. That's great. Oh, you're in this denomination. That's great. Oh, you're wearing a robe and you're wearing accoutrements. Oh, that's great. He didn't say any of those things. He said, you have to be born again. And then the guy goes, well, how do I be born again? In my, can I go through my mother's womb a second time? Probably hyperbole. And Jesus tells him what I just read to you, right? That which is the flesh is the flesh. That which is the spirit is the spirit. You have to be born of the spirit of the living God. And I believe that uh, Nicodemus left and was a changed man. Joseph of Arimathea. You see uh, Acts 6-7. This is after the, the crucifixion, resurrection, the ascension. It said many priests came to the faith. A lot of priests gave up their priesthood because they realized that Jesus was the priest. Amazing. All these religious leaders started to come to faith in the living God. It's powerful stuff. Last part. The title is It Takes Two. Now, macro, it's the Israelites. It's a big situation. A lot of stuff going on. It's history. But on a smaller scale, personally, where are you? Where am I? How close are we to the Lord? Not a bad thing to reevaluate ourselves every so often. If you consider yourself a Christian and have, dr have drifted, come back. I love one of my favorite, pa favorite parables is that of the prodigal son. It shows you the heart of God and his heart towards us. And the son went out and he took his inheritance and he wild living and spent all, he blew all his money and probably besmirched the father's name. But the father was there at the horizon just waiting to hug his son. That's our God. And the parable was insane to the hearers. No, nobody does that in this patriarchal society. And Jesus is like, but my father does. My father does. Anytime you want to come back, you came here this morning, you're listening this morning, you're distant, come back. The Father's arms are wide. The Lord Jesus' arms are wide. He wants to just hug you and kiss you and bless you. If you don't know the Lord, you are separated from God. So don't put the cart before the horse. We'll give you an opportunity to come up to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, you're so awesome. Just love your, you know, just to take some wild scenario from 3,000 years ago in a distant land, different language, different culture, a lot of things we can't even identify with as Americans, but the lessons don't change. They're there. They're timeless. They're eternal. I just pray as the uh, worship team gets ready to lead us into worship, if there's anybody here who doesn't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you know, when I was in my 20s and I went to a Bible teaching church and a pastor said that, I knew in my heart I didn't know Jesus. 
I only called out to him when I was in trouble. That's not knowing Jesus. And there was no shame. I received Jesus. I was loved and accepted. And uh, the Lord did a great work. So I just want to ask if there's anybody here, you know in your heart that you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior. Come up to the front. I'll just lead you in a short prayer. This is a glorious celebration. You come forward, enjoy the Lord, walk with Him all the days of this life and beyond. You come forward. Christ as their Savior. If you have questions, I'll be available after service. Ask away because it's a big decision. It's the right decision, but just come up and, and ask. Um, also want to give a moment before we partake of communion. I think this is fitting. And it does, it's okay. It's a little bit of distance. It's a big distance. It doesn't matter. Maybe you, you, you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You are saved, but maybe you've drifted. I just want to give an opportunity before we partake of communion. If there's anybody who'd just like to rededic rededicate themselves to the Lord, just symbolically stand to get closer to God. We'll pray. We'll pray about that. Does anybody want to stand and rededicate their lives? You know, I'm not even looking because it's not for me to know. It's for God to know. And you stand as if you're the only person in this room just want to pray. Dear Lord God, you're so awesome. You know, one of the titles was going to be for today's message. It didn't have to come to this. You know, if they just would have turned the ship around before this calamity. Lord, you have people here who are standing, who are saying to you, I want to be closer to you, Lord. Lord, we know you don't move. We know that you always want us close. I just pray, Lord, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would help us to see what we need to see to just get back on the right path, Lord. We're running the race to win, but maybe we're running in the grass a little bit and the, the littered leaves and the wood area instead of being back on the track, Lord. So I just pray, fill us with your Holy Spirit and uh, that we just rededicate ourselves to you and just move closer to you.